We come on this eighth Sunday after Pentecost to the last gospel reading for this liturgical season from Mark. Next Sunday we move on to the Gospel of John. Today's lesson is a fitting transition between those gospels as Mark is so vivid in his descriptions of the stories of Jesus' life. And we have two of those stories today. We read from Mark chapter 6, beginning with verse 30. So the apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. Later, when they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. Headline, Galilee Gazette. They're back. Disciples of the local teacher and healer, Jesus of Nazareth, returned today following their first mission trip throughout all the villages of the area, sent out in pairs by the Nazarene to proclaim repentance, cast out demons, and heal the sick. They took no food, no provisions, or money with them along the way. They reportedly stayed wherever anyone would listen to them and put them up for the night. Attempts to meet with Jesus today were canceled due to the fact that the crowds were coming to him in such large numbers. For Jesus' popularity, they say, has grown in this area to the point that people press on him wherever he is. One anonymous source tells the Gazette that Jesus and his disciples are so busy they do not even have time to eat. As a result, they left the city dock today late by boat and headed up the coast, where Jesus has moved the meeting to an unknown location. Most likely, the headline tomorrow will be, they've been spotted again. No rest for the weary. I just love Mark's stories in the gospel. His stories are like vivid snapshots or photographs of episode after episode from the life of Jesus' ministry. And they carry these images and meanings that I think speak directly to us as disciples of Jesus today. To us as brothers and sisters in the life of this body of Christ that we call the church. The first image in this story today, of course, is rest. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. Now let's be honest. Does that image resonate with many of our lives today? We don't have time for breakfast or for lunch, so we eat breakfast bars and lunch bars. 
We're so besieged with busyness that we grab a cup of coffee here and maybe a bagel or some fast food meal there. We pass our family members on the go between what? Sports practices and school and community and work and yes, even church functions. We go and we go and we go as long as we can. We also go as fast as we can. And we offer up our energies to the gods of the electronic world or the gods of accomplishment or the gods of lifestyle or the gods of social expectation or even information. When do we stop? When do we actually rest? When do we spend time talking with and listening to and quite literally being with our shepherd, with Jesus Christ? For a church full of busyness, when do we spend time with, with the one who would actually direct our service? and direct our teaching, our healing, and our attempts to minister to a high-flying, fast-paced, electronically addicted culture. A culture that is starving for free time. Starving for unmanaged schedules. Starving for time to take a Sabbath breath. I think starving for rest. Sometimes when I'm eating at a restaurant and the server brings the food and asks, can I get you anything else? I'm just always tempted to say, yes, a week off. <laughs> and inevitably, the server will grin or maybe frown, but agree with me. In fact, one recently said, honey, I wish I could. I would like one myself. I haven't had a week off in over a year. Jesus says to his disciples, who have evidently been pretty effective in their witness for him in the Galilee, come away with me to a deserted place, all by yourselves, and rest a while. Friends, it's an invitation to more than just a week off. It's an invitation to something we all need, to an important spiritual rhythm for disciples of Christ. The rhythm of moving more intentionally and more fully into the presence of God from other people and activities. Moving to a place where we are provided rest and renewal and direction. And then returning into the presence of the people and other activities rested more capable in our work as Christ's hands and feet in the world. This spiritual rhythm is both personal and I would contend communal. We need to rest as individuals and we need to rest as brothers and sisters serving in the church to reform ourselves as the body of Christ. There is no substitute for rest. The reality of this need for rest is probably pointed out pretty quickly by Mark in the second image here in these, this passage today when he says that no sooner has Jesus invited his disciples to come away to a deserted place and rest than the crowd see where Jesus and the disciples are headed in the boat. So the people hurry there from other towns and villages by foot, according to Mark. And they're waiting for them when they arrive to land the boat. I don't know how you see this picture, but to me it's like saving your vacation at the beach until October. You know when nobody's there. And then finding out when you arrive that there's the World Shriners Convention going on. 
I mean, I can't speak for the disciples in Mark's story, but I do know that in a few verses in this chapter, a few verses later, it's the disciples who are asking Jesus to send the crowds away. And even though I'm sure that the situation was unexpected, and the disciples' reaction was understandable. Jesus not only lands the boat after seeing all the people waiting for him on the shore, but he has compassion on them. Why? Because they are like sheep without a shepherd. You see, the great shepherd of the sheep always has compassion. Come, passion. Quite literally, with suffering. Jesus himself suffers to see such a hurting, wandering, leaderless flock of people. Jesus himself suffers to see people driven by their own sense of desperation. And Jesus' capacity to identify with them calls forth from him a love and a care that extends to every one of them without distinction. Surely Jesus has compassion for his disciples, but now he responds to the crowds, regardless of how they got there and regardless of the demands that they will ultimately make on him. Mark says that in his compassion, Jesus then teaches the crowd many things. The shepherd, the compassionate one, always brings to desperation his presence, his healing, and his insight. Indeed, his teaching. Teaching which always promises to lead people to a new understanding, to new health, and to a new way of life. What Jesus wants here in his compassion is, of course, disciples who will work with him. What Jesus wants is partners in compassion. What Jesus wants are companions willing to adopt his ministry as their own. Companions who are willing to work with him, not just for him. I remember that Barbara Brown Taylor wrote once that we seem to forget that Jesus told his disciples that I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. You see, it should be good news that we are received into God's compassionate service as friends to carry on Christ's work of compassion in the world. It should be good news that we are called each according to to our gifts, gifts that are given to us by God. But frankly, when it comes to suffering alongside of a desperate world, some of us would really rather decline the honor of being friends and just stay put in the servants' quarters. You know, if we stay there, somebody else makes the decisions. If we stay there, somebody else can carry all the responsibility. If we stay there in the servants' quarters, all we have to do is follow orders. We can be loyal. We can be reliable. We can polish the silver better than anyone else. We can do more than we're asked and never complain. But when push comes to shove and the job of compassion gets too hard, we can hang up our apron and go home. Being a servant means doing a job for someone else. It means taking a subordinate role. Let someone else show compassion today. Let someone else suffer with a desperate world. I just work here. But being a compassionate friend of the Good Shepherd, at least according to Mark's gospel, means landing the boat on a beach full of hurting, 
sick and desperate people because you see people who have no shepherd. Frankly, it means you are self-employed. No one is there to tell you what to do or how to do it. The hours are irregular. You cannot control the need that comes your way. And there's no pay for overtime. <clears throat> Jesus, the compassionate good shepherd, is Lord of my life. And I will take the consequences. Jesus, the good shepherd, is Lord of of our congregation and we'll land the boat to offer caring and healing to suffering people wherever and whenever we can and really isn't that the third image in Mark's snapshots today where Jesus and the disciples are in the boat again and they land over at Gennesaret, this little town between Magda and Capernaum on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. They approach that landing and Jesus is immediately recognized. And Mark says people rushed about and brought the sick to him wherever he went. They laid them, in those in need, on mats, he says, even in the marketplaces, any place close to where Jesus will walk by, reaching out, reaching out to touch the fringe of his cloak, hoping somehow they will receive healing. Author Karen Eust writes about this episode in Mark, and she makes a pretty powerful point to the church today. She says that this story at Gennesaret should encourage faith communities to recognize the extent to which the world is suffering and in need of healing that Christian communities can offer. The Gospel of Mark is full of people rushing around and begging for an opportunity to be made whole through some kind of encounter with God. People in need people who are looking for healing. But this is not how many congregations typically experience the neediness of the world of which we are a part. Because people in the search for healing are far more likely to seek out therapists or doctors or self-help books or drugs than they are to walk in that door into the doors of the church. And perhaps this is because people outside of the church do not recognize Christ's healing presence within communities of faith. In Mark, the people of Gennesaret recognize Jesus as a healer and they respond accordingly. You says if the church today is unrecognizable as a place of healing, then maybe we need to reflect on what our mission and purpose are in the world and how we communicate the good news of God's healing grace today in our time and in this place. I agree with you. And I think this image of the compassionate healing church calls us as it did Christ to be out there in the world to be where the suffering is to reach out with passion to persons in need of God's grace and to be the body of Christ sent into the world to help God repair brokenness perhaps it's high time we embraced our role of being the fringe of Jesus' cloak to all who reach out, to all who want to touch and to be touched, to all who want to be truly whole. Headline, Winston-Salem Journal. They're still at it. The 244-year-old Moravian congregation in Salem still calls for the sanctity of rest, 
the centrality in the gospels of suffering alongside others in need, and the call to be agents of Christ's healing in the world. And they invite you to join them. All gifts are needed and used. This congregation is known to take time to eat together, especially chicken pie. They listen for the voice of the Good Shepherd who knows them and calls them by name. And their mission is clear to fulfill Christ's call to love God, live in community, and serve our neighbor. In this congregation, the central affirmation of discipleship is not complicated. Want to know how God feels about us, about humanity? Look at Jesus. Want to know how we are called to live in response to that love? Look at Jesus. Amen.